Hi, I'm Courtney Burnett, the Planning Program Manager here at DC Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency. And I'm Emily Rush, the Chief Performance Officer at DC's Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency. The presentation you're about to see is a construct that Emily and I designed to solve a whole host of preparedness issues that we've been having. Our plans have been far too long and they're unusable during emergencies. We're not speaking the same language in planning as we are in operations. And then following an emergency, we're not adding that common terminology into our evaluation and our capability building. So the point of the services construct is really to implement the national preparedness goal at the local level and create that cohesiveness and that common terminology and streamline the process from planning to operating to evaluating to capability building. So this is a presentation that we've given a few times in different forums, most recently at the 2019 National Homeland Security Conference in Phoenix. And the feedback we got while we were there was that this is an issue that jurisdictions around the country are running into as they implement their preparedness processes. So we wanted to get you this presentation so you have it for reference and can pull from it the pieces of this construct that make sense for you in your own jurisdictions. We're going through our first implementation of this now with the rewrite of our EOP. And as we do that, we're continuing to develop tools and templates to assist in the implementation. So we'll post those here and you'll have access to those as well. Our contact information is on this page as well as on the last slide of the presentation. And we'd encourage you to reach out if you have any questions or want to discuss um, the concept as you work through implementation of your own processes. Thank you. Thank you. So Courtney and I have been working in preparedness here at HCMA for several years and over the years we've noticed that we have trouble um, talking to each other when we get outside of our specific areas of expertise within preparedness and even more so when we get outside preparedness into operations or into conversations with some of our partner agencies outside of the EM specific field. And we really wanted to figure out sort of why it was so difficult to have these conversations in a, in a cohesive and coherent way and what we could do to fix it. So we started looking into it and what we realized is that we have a lot of language to talk about this. Just in response, we have 15 emergency support functions, we have 15 core capabilities, seven lifelines, and 29 things that EMAP tells us we have to address in our emergency operations plans in order to be meeting the best practices of the industry. So this is a lot of different words, it's a lot of vocabulary to talk about what is fundamentally the same set of activities that we do every day. So the reason we're having trouble having these conversations is because we're literally speaking different languages as we work through different parts of the preparedness cycle. So what do we do? What we wanted to do first was um, look at our own agency and then at our partner agencies as well and talk to them about what it is that you actually do, right? So there's a certain set of activities that our agencies are going to perform in relationship to an emergency um, sort of all the time, right? Um, sort of standard and baked into um, agency operating procedures. So we went out and talked to our agencies in the district and we said, what is it that you do? And here on the screen we have a, an example of some, of some of the services that we identified that our agencies performed. So snow removal or debris removal for the public works departments, public alerting and EOC operations for the EMAs, site security from the police department, family reunification or shelter operations for human services. So we really wanted to look at sort of in their own words, what was it that our agencies were doing? And we found that it was a lot easier to have some of these conversations about these activities when we took all of those constructs, the ESFs and the core capabilities, out of the conversation and talked a little more plain language about what it is that we actually do. It's important, though, that while we, while we talk about our services in these plain language terms, we're able to relate them back to the structures that we use so that we can remain interoperable with um, our state partners, with other jurisdictions, and with our federal partners as well. So we wanted to make sure as we went through and looked at what we did in these new terms that they all linked back to each of these constructs. 
So we see here that each of these ties back to one of the 15 emergency support functions, ties back to one of the 15 core capabilities, ties back to each of the seven lifelines, and ties back to those um, subject areas that we have to address for EMAP standards. So whether we are planning by ESF or coordinating with FEMA by lifeline during a response or working with our EMAP assessors to achieve or maintain our EMAP accreditation, we're able to take these concepts that we've identified and map them back to whatever the construct, whatever the language is that we're using for that part of the preparedness process. So again, it, it takes all of the words, all of the language that we've identified across all of these different constructs and gives us a consistent language that we can talk about um, what we do throughout the preparedness cycle. So what Emily and I wanted to do was establish a construct around those functions that we were doing every day. You saw that list. Those were the tasks and activities that either we or our partners were delivering all the time. And just as ESFs or core capabilities or mission areas have those specific rules around when they're used, why they're used, we wanted to add that level of concreteness around this particular construct. So we, we came up with the word services and wanted to add that structure. So what does that look like? Well, every single service has a single agency owner. That allows that particular agency or organization or department to define the service, the capability target, and the necessary resources to meet the target. It also deconflicts a lot of confusion over who exactly does what when we get to some of those less often provided services that often happen following an emergency. Every single service has a specific capability level. We followed the common POETI model. So in order for a service to be at full capability, it needs to have a plan, an organization or staff, equipment, training, and exercise. Services are inherently delivered outside of your particular agency. So it's either provided to other agencies or to the residents or community. So that would not include things that happen internally, such as payroll. Every service then likely interacts with dependent services. And we'll talk through more examples in a few moments. Now, one of the big questions we get when we talk about single agency ownership is, well, we work in emergency management. We inherently need to work with our partners, work with our stakeholders to make sure we know how to work together. Well, the beauty of services, it gets those roles and responsibilities really clear at the single agency owner level, but then when you combine a set of services, it can create a mission. Missions may be a large shelter mission, or it could be when we're talking about particular threats and hazards. Maybe we need a certain combination of services to deliver a shelter mission, or maybe we need a combination of services to respond to a snowstorm. And again, we'll talk through in more detail what this looks like. So when you're actually building out your services, here are the components, a service name, an owner, the trigger to turn it on, and we want to get more granular than what threat or hazard, what specific situation is going to re require the delivery of that particular set of tasks and activities, what dependent services need to also turn on or activate when your service turns on, what is the concept of operations or those three to seven milestones you need to hit to deliver your service? The critical tasks that fall under each portion of the CONOPS, the target and the required resources to meet that target. What other checklists, SOPs, MOUs that relate to that service that you need to be able to reference, critical information requirements, and very importantly, an alignment matrix. When you're building out your plan in particular, these are the most critical elements. 
services are inherently outliving in the world, but we know we need to write them down somewhere. And you can certainly include all elements in your plan. So let's run through an example. A particular name may be shelter operations. The owner may be the Department of Human Services. The trigger to turn it on, let's say 10 displaced residents or maybe 10 displaced households. You can decide, but again, you want to get a little bit more granular than, oh, a snowstorm. The dependent services, and these are just two examples. So when you activate a shelter, you may need site security, which could be provided by your police department. It may be another agency in your jurisdiction. And then medical assessments provided by the Department of Health. Again, this is just two examples of a dependent service for shelter operations. Then you need to define your concept of operations. So what does it look like to actually deliver the shelter operations service? It can be as simple as activate, operate, demobilize, but it's good to add a certain level of detail. Here you can see the subcategories of each of those phases. Then once you have your concept of operations, you can add more detail with critical tasks. It depends on the service owner as to what level of detail you want to get to with the checklist. This is something that you can have separately from your service plan or included in your, in your service plan, and it makes it a little bit more functional when you want to reference it. Then you need to define your target and required resources. So based on the target that you've set, we want to look across those poetic elements that Courtney was speaking about earlier to figure out what the resources are that we need in order to be able to deliver this service at the target level. So as an example here, we probably want a shelter operations plan. I have as a planning assumption for the purposes of this example that I have 2,000 residents that I need to shelter and my facilities generally house about 200. So if we do the math on it, I'm going to need about 10 facilities, which means working 12-hour shifts, I'm going to need about 20 teams to keep this service operating at this level. I'm going to need 10 shelter trailers, packs, whatever, sets of equipment that I can send out to each of those 10 shelter sites. And I'm going to need the sites themselves. I'm going to need to do some training, maybe one training for my shelter managers and one training for my shelter staff. And then I'm going to run a progressive exercise series to make sure that once I have those resources in place, I am actually able to deliver the service and it looks the way I think it's going to look. So this is my full set of resources that I need to deliver shelter operations at the target level that we've identified. And this is generally the part where people start to panic because there's a lot of stuff, right? Um, and most of our jurisdictions aren't going to be able to maintain the level of resources necessary to operate at target level if the target is a little bit higher or certainly at a catastrophic level. Um, so we'll get into this a little bit more later, but I just want to point out at this point in the presentation that there are ways that we can address this, right, without necessarily in-housing all of these resources. So the Red Cross, for example, can provide a lot of resources um, when it comes to shelter operations. So if I can potentially put an MOU in place, that's another plan that I need, but now it allows the Red Cross to cover a large chunk of the resources, the staff and the equipment that I need to be able to operate these shelters. And FEMA, for example, has a lot of um, technical assistance. They do a lot of TA offerings. So looking to our federal partners as well um, for some help with, with some of the training and exercises and the analyses, some of the other things that we do as we work through this COETI process. So again, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation, but um, as a general example, this is how we look to resource to target levels using the Poeti elements. After you've established your target and what resources you need to deliver that target, you then move on to identifying what SOPs or MOUs or checklists that you would like to reference with activation of this service. Emily just mentioned an MOU at the Red Cross that you may need to set up shelters at your target level. So that's something you would want to be able to reference.
critical information requirements. So depending on what kind of information you want to be tracking about the activation and delivery of your particular service, you may want a set of critical information requirements or essential elements of information regarding that service, whether it's something that your leadership wants collection of or they are key information that you should be tracking to know what resources you need to be asking for. And that's something that you can identify ahead of time. And very important, importantly, as Emily talked about in remaining interoperable with our partners, having that alignment matrix for every single service. Here you see service shelter operations, the owner being Department of Human Services, the ESF being six, mass care. That's what it is federally and, and here in the district, but it may be slightly different in your jurisdiction. So making sure you, you jot that down correctly. The EOC branch, Lifeline, food, water, shelter, and the core capability of mass care. Then you build that out for all of your services. And you end up with all of your identified services that your jurisdiction delivers. Seems like a lot. Okay, don't panic. I promise this is not as much work as you think it is. First, consider a couple things. A lot of this is probably already in your emergency operations plan. It just may not be at the level of detail that would actually be useful for you and your partners. If it's anything like us, you have a lot of 300, 400, 500 page plans. So instead of having those, and those take a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of manpower, instead direct your efforts towards creating these component level service plans that you can then pick and pull into whatever larger conops you need to, whether it's, like I mentioned before, a particular hazard or functional delivery such as a shelter mission. This also allows very clearly identified roles and responsibilities for all of your partners in order to establish that common operating picture and really having a good understanding of what every agency or organization is supposed to do Oftentimes, it gets a little bit lost in a long emergency operations plan when everybody is listed, it's mixed all around, and everyone's supporting everybody. Here, the roles and responsibilities are very clearly identified. So let's talk about how these can mash up into that mission-level planning I've been talking about. So you have your services all on the in your toolbox. Then... Like any jurisdiction, you identify your hazards. So here you can see a generic list of threats and hazards that you've identified. Within each of those, you can identify the what that threat or hazard means, so define it. Your mission statement, so what are your key priorities for that particular threat or hazard. Now, that long list of roles and responsibilities, that can go away. What is replaced with that is your service checklist. So instead of having long lists of roles and responsibilities, you instead can list the services you've identified that you think you may need to activate for that particular hazard. You may have a set of required services you know will absolutely turn on, and then maybe a secondary list, depending on the situation, whether you would need to activate them. And we'll run through an example in a moment. Then you'll have your concept of operations. So. How are you delivering your services? In what order? How does that functionally look as you progress through that particular threat or hazard? Now, depending on your bandwidth and how much effort you, uh, you know, have time for with every threat and hazard, you can add some optional elements to your checklist. Key decisions by phase, that can be especially important for some of these time-bound hazards where you need to pre-stage resources 96 hours ahead of time, so documenting those decisions. Cascading impacts that, are, that may happen with that particular hazard so that you know what services to consider activating, courses of action, and then again, that list of critical information requirements and essential elements of information. So if there's information particular to the threat or hazard you want to be tracking, you can do so. Again, this isn't necessarily required, 
But this is particularly good to include for those threats and hazards your jurisdiction faces all the time. We get a snowstorm every year and we get a hurricane every year. So maybe we'll add those extra elements for that particular checklist. But you can at least have those core components in all of your threats and hazards. So what does this look like in real time? Steady state, we have all of our service plans and then we have our hazard checklists on the shelf or hopefully in an electronic way of sharing it, whether it's WebEOC or OneDrive or whatever situational awareness tool that you have, so that when an incident occurs, this is what they look like in real time. Let's say we just got a forecast of a imminent hurricane. You pull your hurricane checklist off the shelf, and you have a set of missions and the services that fall under those missions that you can activate. Let's say we need to activate flood fighting, sandbag operations, sheltering, site security, debris, and incident management. So you check those off and you pull those particular service plans off the shelf. Now, as we know, forecasts can change. So let's say initially it was gonna be a category two hurricane kind of skirting the coast, not that big a deal. And then suddenly we get an updated forecast that it has strengthened to a Category 3, and it's turned and is heading straight for you, and you need to activate a couple more services, you pull those services off the shelf, and you can continue to expand your incident-specific playbook however you need. And when you deactivate a service, you can take that out. So what does this look like in the field? We know that inherently our, most of our services are being delivered out in the world. So here you can see a more simple example. Let's say it's a structure fire, not around any individuals. The fire suppression service would be activated. Now let's say it's a little bit more complex where it's a fire in an apartment building where individuals are living. Suddenly we have the fire suppression service activated, but we also need to activate a shelter mission made up of the sheltering service, the medical assessment service, the site security service, whatever other services you need to activate. It becomes a little bit more complicated. Now, let's consider a boundless emergency, such as a hurricane. That's going to infect, affect most of your community, if not all of it. Suddenly, you have lots of missions that you're activating. Here, it would be a flood fighting mission, a sheltering mission, a debris management mission, Again, where you can pick and pull the services you need to activate within each of those missions. But they're happening potentially in a lot of different places or at different phases within the emergency. But again, you can pull out your incident-specific playbook and all of those individual service plans map where they need to be. So you only have to reference the particular plan that you need. And we know in a, in a larger incident, your EOC is likely activated. So how do we make that connection back to the EOC? Well, again, here is an example of the DC EOC org chart. Yours may look a little bit different. But however it's organized, you should be able to map each of your service plans to the functional area in the EOC so that they can adequately support the folks in the field but everybody's working from the same sheet of music, that same checklist or service plan. Then, because you're all working from those same set of services that boil up into those larger missions, you can create your incident objectives for either, it might be a service target in your IAP out in the field, and then whatever you're using in the EOC, maybe an IAP or an EAP some folks use, but you can create your incident objectives for your entire jurisdiction based on those set of services and the larger missions. Then, depending on the software you're using or the system you're using, you're able to track the delivery of each of these services as well and what their current status is. You can also, as you've identified what resources are required to deliver that service down the road, and Emily will talk about this more in a, in a few minutes, you can identify what resources are deployed out to the field 
and where, where you have gaps. So you know when you need to be activating an EMAC request or alerting FEMA to some of those gaps. When you're doing work in, let's say, the planning section and you're trying to make sure you're sharing information or you're working in a task force within the EOC, you can pull out that same service plan and create informational documents, whether it's a situation report or if you need to create an informational page for decision makers. Here you can see an example of a shelter operations mission when we're trying to establish what shelters will be opened and how we go through the steps of activating the shelters. Again, to make sure everyone's working from that same sheet of music. And as some feedback we've gotten, there may be senior leadership that doesn't want to look at a long plan. So this is one way that you can put it into a sort of more graphically appealing and digestible format. Now, the hurricane's gone, and we move into after action. So one of the big problems we know, after every single incident, you have your corrective actions, but the plans aren't necessarily updated. The beauty of single agency ownership is that every single agency or organization that owns a service can then, either real-time during the incident or directly following the incident, update their service plans. So your EMA agency, for example, will pull out that hurricane checklist and make updates. You put that back on the shelf, and then through hot wash and after action, you go through and you make the changes or updates to each of your service plans. You then put all of those updated service plans and checklists back on the shelf, and they're ready for the next incident. So let's say a few weeks later, we have an active shooter incident. You pull that checklist off the shelf. Again, activate the services that are required for that particular situation. And you have your incident-specific playbook. Then, at the close of that incident, you go through the same process. You update your checklist, and then you go through and update each of your service plans. So you are always updating and always maintaining your plans and always working from the most up-to-date information. Just because you updated your hurricane plan doesn't mean that you can't then respond to an active shooter incident because you have looked at those component service plans that don't change necessarily except for some of the minute detail depending on the threat or hazard. You still have a very updated plan to work from. Then we move back into steady state. So now we're back in steady state and what do we do with our services from here, right? We're not operating them. So um, what is it that we need to do to make sure that we're going to be able to operate them um, when the next incident occurs? So in order to understand our service capacity and the, the level at which we want to be able to operate these services, we need to really understand what our threats and hazards are and what the impacts of those threats and hazards are going to be for our individual communities. So on an iterative basis, we want to be going through and sort of re-looking at that list of threats and hazards and making sure that that is still the list of the most likely or most impactful um, events for your specific community. So in this case, we look at a hurricane and then we want to look very specifically at the impacts of, of a hurricane on the specific community. Um, in order to get to those targets that we want to build to, um, more than just understanding what our most likely threats and hazards are, we need to understand sort of at, at the mathematical level, um, numerically, what it is that we can expect to see as far as impacts are concerned. So in this example, we're looking at a flood map for DC that should give us some idea about the um, level of displacements we're likely to see, which then drives that shelter target that we've been speaking about throughout. So during the steady state, as we go through this iterative review of threats and hazards and impacts, we want to revisit those targets and say, has anything changed? Are there new threats or hazards? Um, have the, the demographics and the layout of my community shifted in a way that changes what I expect those impacts to be? And then either validate or update 
our targets to reflect the most current information. So then once we have the target, we can turn back to the owning agency. And here it's our um, District Department of Human Services. And we say, okay, here's your target. Um, take, a, take a really close look at what it is that you need to be able to execute this and what you have broken down by those poetic elements. So here, and this is it's just an example of what this could look like. Um, if we need that one shelter plan, we have that. We're at 100%. We saw we needed those 20 shelter teams. And in this instance, I've got one. Um, 10 shelter trailers, 10 facilities, the two trainings, and the three exercises. If I have one shelter trailer, all 10 facilities, I have one training established, and I've got a couple exercises planned. So we have some capability in each of these areas uh, as we look at developing this. But what we can see from laying it out this way is that it's really our organization. It's the lack of teams and the lack of that equipment, that deployable equipment, that's going to stop us from being able to execute this service at the target. So we've done you know, a lot of planning around this. We've done training development. We've done exercises. And I think there can sometimes be an assumption that when you've gone through that planning training exercise process, now we have a capability. And when we break it down like this and look more granularly at those resources in each of the poetic elements, we can start to see where that's not necessarily the case and which, which elements of the poetic construct are going to stop that delivery. So here, it's our teams, right? So if we're going to put additional resources towards this, we want to be able to look at focusing on teams and equipment. So with the constraints that we currently have on the teams, we're operating at about 5% of our target level. If we were to add three additional teams and one additional trailer, we're able to move that from five to 20. So this, this look at this sort of granular level and looking really at sort of the math behind the delivery of the capability and the capacity, it lets us really target where we need to be putting resources in order to move the needle on this particular capability. So in that example where we saw our shelter operations capability go from 5% to 20%, we sort of score that service um, as we do this evaluation and at point two. So out of 100% of the service, what are we able to offer? Point two for shelter operations. And then we give each of our each of our other services that we're looking at a score as well. And this, I hope, has sounded familiar to many of you um, as the Thyra process, right? Looking at our threats and hazards, setting targets, and understanding where our gaps are and at what level we're currently able to operate. So then, because, um, as we discussed before, we mapped each of these services back to all of those constructs, we have them mapped to core capability, and we're able to report that information out during our thyroid processes. So then what? So now we know where we are, um, and we've, we've done our reporting, and now we need to build. So there are a lot of services, right? We have just a small sample here. Um, I suspect most of our jurisdictions will end up with a pretty decent number, um, to the extent that we're not going to be able to resource them all to get everything to target level at the same time, right? We're going to have to do some prioritization on where to put our limited resources. So in order to do that, we need to be able to set some evaluation criteria that are going to be standardized and allow us to more strategically focus on the services that are going to have the biggest impact on our ability to address an emergency, either in response, recovery, um, or prevention protection. So we have a couple examples here, and these, are, these will change um, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and may change from strategic planning cycle to strategic planning cycle. So what we've included here are just some examples for consideration. So first is supports health and life safety. Obviously, in the event of any sort of emergency, we want to make sure that our responders and our residents are are healthy and are able to stay alive throughout that event. Um, so any of the services that really focus on making sure that people are safe, we want to prioritize those. 
Next, we may look at the frequency with which services appear in defined missions. So as Courtney discussed earlier, once we've laid out all of our services, operationally, we bucket them back up into missions. And you may have a service that appears over and over again from mission to mission. Um, site security was one that she mentioned when we were talking about a shelter mission. And you're likely to need that site security at most of your incidents. Um, so a shelter mission would have a site security component. A family reunification center would have a site security component. A logistic staging area or a point of distribution. We're going to need that same site security service to show up in multiple services. So when we see that service appear over and over again, we can assume that it's going to have an impact on most of our operations, which means it'll have an overall larger impact than some of the services that appear less frequently. So here, here we resort again and raise um, the priority of those frequently recurring services. Similarly, um, if we've linked the services back to threats and hazards through those uh, mission and service checklists, we can look at the likelihood of the occurrence of threats linked to associated missions or services. So if there are services that only show up in response to specific threats or hazards, what is the likelihood that that threat is going to occur? As Courtney mentioned, here on the East Coast um, in D.C., we know we're always going to look at extreme heat in the summer and extreme cold in the winter. So what are the services that show up in association with threats that we know are going to occur over and over again? If we're able to execute those services at target levels, that's going to have an impact on sort of our, our most frequently occurring operations. And there's another one that I talk about that I don't have on the slide, but when we looked at the sort of the Poetti breakdown on the previous slide, that red, yellow, green, we could see that there was a really big discrepancy between our planning, training, and exercise components and our um, organization and equipment components. And when you look at that, what you can see is that we've done a lot of work on the preparedness side, um, doing the planning, building the training, conducting the exercises. But we haven't put the resources towards the, the people and the stuff that we need to be able to execute that service. So when you see those really big discrepancies, that may also be another indicator that that is a place where we've already done so much work that just a little bit more may really get us to the point where we're moving the needle on that capability overall. So whether or not that's a, an evaluation criteria that you use, it is something to consider as you're looking through and doing the prioritization. So again, um, we resort to move the, the services up that hit as many of these criteria as they do. So now we have our prioritized list of scored services. They've gone through the evaluation criteria. And now we need to take them to our decision makers and say, here's the layout. Here's what this looks like. This is what we want to be able to do. This is what we can do. Help us figure out where to focus our resources. And I have in this example um, the Urban Area Working Group for um, the UASI as the decision-making body. Um, this could be you know, another governance group that oversees your resource allocation. It could be your, your mayor, um, your emergency manager, whoever it is that's going to make the decisions about what resources get allocated for what purposes. So we want to take them this information so that they can start looking down the list and saying, all right, shelter operations is our highest priority and the score is pretty low, so we know we're going to need to put resources there. 911 management, very high priority, but they're operating at optimal levels, so we don't need to resource that right now, right? And sort of continue to work down the list and figure out, based on priority, based on scores, um, what is it that's really going to have the biggest impact and where do we want to focus? In this example, they select shelter operations, family reunification, and incident management support. And each of those comes with its own set of um, poetic elements, poetic resources that we may or may not have on hand. So then we go back and we say, all right, DHS, shelter operations has been identified as a really high priority. Let's figure out 
how we're going to use the resources that we have available to plug some of these gaps in our shelter capability. All right, so we go in and we do this closer examination of our resources. And there's a certain level of resourcing that we're going to want to build in-house or maintain the resources that we already have. And then some of it, as we discussed earlier, we can outsource. So in this example, and this is what we've discussed before, we can say we're going to build this capability to 50% in-house. We're going to get to the point where we can conduct shelter operations for 1,000 people or 50% of the target population. And then we're going to outsource the rest to the Red Cross. So we put that additional MOU in place, and then we can turn on those resources. And what we can see in this example, because we did have that discrepancy um, between the planning, training, and exercise and organization and equipment elements, um, just by creating this MOU and using these external resources to plug some of those gaps, we've been able to move the needle on this capability from 20 to 70%. So as we continue to identify the personnel and train the teams and find the money to buy the equipment, we can look externally to the organization and put those agreements in place so that we can build the capability as we're working on some of the pieces that may take a little bit longer. But then what happens when it's a bigger event than we thought or um, than we were planning for, right? Like the likelihood of, a, of an event that may give us this impact might be you know, moderate to high. Whereas the likelihood of an event that's going to give us 10 times this level of impact is very low, but at some point, it's going to occur. So if we get a, a, a bigger impact than anticipated and we have to start looking at catastrophic planning, what do we do then? So in this example, we have some options, right? We can look at prescripted mission assignments from FEMA. Um, what can we look to our federal partners to provide? And knowing, knowing where we are with our resources and what we know we're going to need in a catastrophic emergency, talking to them ahead of time um, and making sure that they know what the ask is going to be. And they're able to set some of those up um, in advance of a disaster so that we can more quickly mobilize those resources when the time comes. Similarly, we may want to put contracts or uh, memorandums of agreement in place with our private sector partners, perhaps, or our places of worship. Um, additional resources that exist in the community um, that if we have the appropriate agreements in place, we may be able to, ac we may be able to access those resources um, when we have a catastrophic emergency and really need to start looking outside of the set of resources that we were planning to utilize. And then EMAC is another example as well, reaching out to our other state partners um, and local partners to identify resources that they have um, that they may be able to deploy to our jurisdictions when we encounter those emergencies. And these are just a couple of examples. There are a lot of different sort of creative ways to identify the various resources that you may need. Um, the important part, though, when you're looking at building the capability and sort of working through the planning process for what you may need in order to execute the service, is thinking through what is it that you're going to need to hit your target, and what is it that you're going to need once an incident gets to a point where the impacts are greater than, greater than anticipated. And understanding sort of what that call down structure is going to be. Who's your first call when you need more resources, your second call, your third call? And do the people that you're calling know to expect that call and know what you're asking for? Um, the more of that that we can think through and put in place and understand on a blue sky day, the faster we're going to be able to mobilize those resources when we do um, come up against a disaster. So we saw um, as we added that MOU with the Red Cross and, and added those additional resources that we were able to mobilize, we saw this move from the 20% capability to the 70% capability. Now we see a lot of green here. Um, so making this a priority and figuring out the resourcing for it really has allowed us to move the needle on this in a measurable way by looking at those resources at the granular level against the mathematically anticipated impacts of these types of disasters.
So how does it all come together? Um, at the end of the day, this is really a mechanism um, for local implementation of the National Preparedness Goal. So we use our thyra process, our risk assessments, to identify and assess the risk to our specific community. We look at the anticipated impacts of those risks to develop the targets at which we want to be able to execute our, our missions, our services. We build and sustain capabilities by doing that continual re-examination of what resources we need, what we have, and identifying those creative ways to plug some of those resource gaps. We write our plans and um, develop our, our playbooks. We execute um, either through real world response or through exercises. And we go through an after action process and we relook at our plans and our resources and our, our operations and, and make the adjustments that we need to make to incorporate lessons learned. And the services really become sort of the thread that ties all of this together and allows us to have that cohesive and consistent conversation with um, our own organization and with the partners who participate with us in each aspect of this implementation process. Thank you all so much for your time and consideration of this concept, this construct overall. Our contact information is here and we welcome any questions, concerns, comments, anything you want to discuss, or as you work to implement this in your own jurisdictions, any best practices that you find, or any conversation that you'd like to have with us, we welcome. Thank you again.